Uh, uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the fifth meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, for this particular meeting, we have apologies from Neil Bibby. Can I just remind members to put their mobile phones onto silent, please, um, so they don't disrupt proceedings. Uh, the first item on agenda this morning is to take evidence on UK common frameworks. We're joined for this item by Michael Russell, who is the Cabinet Secretary for Government Business and Constitutional Relations. Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by Scottish Government officials Joe Glass, the UK Frameworks Unit Leader, Ian Davidson, the Head of the Constitution and UK Relations. I welcome our witnesses to the meeting and I invite Mike Russell to make an opening statement, please. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and thanks for the uh, invitation to be here today. Um, Jill was reminding me um, when we were talking about this issue earlier this morning that I last spoke to members of this committee about this on the 2nd of November last year, which does seem an age ago, several meaningful votes ago, certainly. And um, I think it is an indication of what has taken place in the last almost four months that this issue has um, diminished in public interest and importance during that time. And of course, uh, that's not by our choice. It is because the prospect of what you might call a negotiated uh, compromise or orderly uh, exit from the EU has uh, diminished during that time. Um, we're not here by choice uh, in the position we are. Uh, we are here because on the, this particular issue, uh, we have faced being dragged out of the EU against our will, and in those circumstances we have tried to come to a rational and reasonable uh, conclusion with the UK government about some of the issues which were always and should remain uh, within the devolved settlement. So um, we're not opposed to UK-wide frameworks, and our actions over the last two years have shown that, where they are in Scotland's interests, but at the bottom of our concern has been the key issue that these should be negotiated and not imposed. And that is the policy we continue to pursue. Um, frameworks are not a policy objective of the uh, Scottish Government. They're an unfortunate necessity given where things were. Where they are now, it is very difficult to say uh, given the circumstances in which we are in. Um, so let me say that as a preamble, because I think it is important in terms of any discussion we have today. Discussions on frameworks have been conducted at official level, overseen by the JMC EU negotiations. There have been several rounds of intensive multilateral policy discussions, primarily focused on what became 24 policy areas where it thought legislation might be required to implement frameworks, although actually now I think there's a very, very much smaller number uh, of frameworks of which that is true. Initial framework outlines in six areas were considered by JMC Ian in October 2018, and it's quite important to note that was before there was the, uh, the, the, the supposed agreement between the UK government and the EU. And those were fisheries, animal health and welfare, nutrition, hazardous substance planning, food and feed safety and hygiene, and public sector procurement. The technical work by officials to complete outline templates is underpinned by the statement of principles agreed by the JMCEN in October 2017, that was a year before, and it's been taken forward by agreement and is without prejudice to the views of ministers. Officials have analysed the draft outlines to draw out some high-level messages and lessons that can inform those frameworks yet to be drafted, particularly to ensure consistent approaches to government's questions. It was never the intention that frameworks would be in place by exit day, and although there's a connection between that and the necessity for various pieces of legislation to be there, it is only a connection, it's, it's not an absolute link, and frameworks remain discrete longer-term arrangements to pu be put in place post-Brexit. Frameworks will only be agreed when there is clarity about the UK's final agreement and future relationship with the EU and the situation in Northern Ireland. The progress on frameworks will therefore continue until, well, until the end of the implementation period, if that is December 2020, but again, that is absolutely up for grabs. Officials are now turning their attention to those frameworks in the non-legislative category. Work also continues on the cross-cutting issues required to be worked through for frameworks to be finalised in the areas of domestic governance, international obligations, trade, the internal market, and where appropriate future funding. Now, we're committed to continue to work collaboratively on developing those frameworks in specific areas, 
but we, of course, we remain resolutely opposed to Section 12, and we will not discuss a framework if a restriction on those devolved powers is imposed. Now, in the, that light, it's a good news that the second uh, report, European Union Withdrawal Act and Common Frameworks, published earlier this month, confirmed that the UK government has again concluded, with us, that it does not need to bring forward any Section 12 regulations at this juncture. That report proves, in my view, that Section 12 was and is unnecessary. The frameworks process has demonstrated this, and it vindicates the position that the Scottish Government took uh, that Section 12 wasn't necessary and should be repealed. So we move to continue the process of engagement. We're keen now to engage businesses and stakeholders, but given what stakeholders are presently confronting in terms of the chaos that exists at Westminster, then I think that's not a matter which stakeholders presently will regard as a priority. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I, I sense from your voice you're obviously carrying some sort of virus or something that's going on, so I hope you're OK through this process. Um, I, I, I noticed from the <coughs> second, second progress um, report, as you just highlighted, uh, the UK government says that there has been significant progress um, in regard to common frameworks. And if that's true, that's good news. Uh, it's good that there's been some good progress as far as the development of common frameworks is concerned. But it's not true to say that the development of these common frameworks was very much taken forward with a pace of delivery um, was ex where the expected outcome was an agreement on the UK leaving um, the EU being signed off successfully and beyond that following a period of transition and that common frameworks were seen as being required to be in place before the end of the transition period. So my question to you, Cabinet Secretary, is given that the UK crashing out of the EU without a deal is still a very live prospect, what does such a scenario mean for the development of common frameworks and the timescales within which the necessary work would be required to complete it, particularly given the evidence that we received from the Scottish Centre for European Relations, who said a no-deal Brexit would likely result in discussions around common frameworks giving way to a crisis response needed to cope with the resulting severe legal, political and economic consequences. I think that has already happened. I think it started to happen in November. I think it accelerated in December with the cancellation of the first meaningful vote, and it has continued apace during January and February, and of course we will be in March at the end of, of this week. Um, I think it's hard, uh, unless you spend time, as, as I do in, in, in Whitehall, uh, to realise how the entire machinery of government has been uh, captured by uh, the issue of no deal and, and the chaos that presently exists. Um, the JMCEN uh, did not meet, I think, in December, met in November, um, has met, I think, in, in, it's difficult to remember now because there's um, so many meetings in London. Every meeting I've been at in London since the middle of November has been pretty much consumed by discussion of no deal. And oh, there may have been other items on the agenda, but they've been largely irrelevant. Um, I, I just think that this issue will not re-emerge as an issue for proper uh, attention um, unless and until there is a agreement on a orderly departure or until Article 50 has been suspended or preferably uh, revoked. But if suspended, then the, and there had also been a ruling out of a new deal and a referendum. So I think we are in a period of, of flux and it's difficult to see when this issue will then return as, as an issue unless there was to be a continuation of the, of the process of trying to um, put in place an orderly departure. But it's very difficult to see when that will be. Okay. Adam Tomkins. Uh, thanks, Kavina. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, you referred to the um, October 2017 um, uh, framework, as it were, for common frameworks. Um, which was agreed by the JMC um, in that month, um, set, setting out the principles in which it is understood across governments in uh, the United Kingdom when common framework, where common frameworks will be required. And the first <coughs> point made in that um, uh, set of principles is that frameworks will be established where they are necessary in order to enable the functioning of the UK internal market whilst acknowledging policy divergence. And I wondered if you could tell the committee what the Scottish Government's understanding is of 
the meaning of that phrase, uh, the functioning of the UK internal market? Yes, I mean, I can. I, I, I think it's important, and I'm not avoiding this, but I think it's important in those principles to refer to principle 2-2 two, two, uh, as well. Frameworks will respect the devolution settlements and the democratic accountability of devolved legislators. Absolutely. Um, because my understanding, I think the issue, if there was an issue in here, and there may not be an issue in here, if there was an issue, then I think the issue between the two governments would be the priority of those two issues. Whether the dev devolved settlements are the basis on which any new understanding of an internal market is built, or whether the internal a, a new understanding of the internal market changes what devolution is and how it operates. I, I think I'm being quite dispassionate about that. Those are, that is at the heart of the issue, if there's an issue to be resolved here. My understanding would be that the devolved settlements allow substantial and sometimes complete policy divergence on key issues and that the inter an internal market would not overrule that. An example of that would be, I think, Damien Green's uh, remark about um, you know, jam makers in Dundee and whatever the one other place he used. Uh, his understanding of an internal market is that you would have a set of rules which would apply, in this case, to jam makers, um, uh, which would be both in Scotland and in England. This would allow the sale of that jam north and south of the border. My understanding of that is there may be circumstances in which there would be different rules for jam makers north and south of the border. Those would be dictated by the requirements of devolution. Um, and devolution might, for example, impose stronger uh, food safety requirements for jam makers north of the border and south of the border. That would be an acceptable exercise of devolved powers. So I think, you know, to go to the heart of the matter, there, there may well be a different understanding of the internal market and how it operates, depending on whether you believe that the devolved settlement and, and the differences of practice and the divergences that have taken place is the thing which should underpin what we do, or whether you believe circumstances have changed and there should now be a set of rules and regulations which, despite devolved competencies, um, should operate, and those should, in some cases, put aside devolved competencies. That's genuinely trying to be a helpful response to you. Okay, so uh, in terms of um, getting into specifics, and perhaps not the specifics of m the manufacture of marmalade in Dundee, but the, the, the specifics of what has been discussed, um, as I understand it, Cabinet Secretary, mainly official level rather than ministerial level so far, that the um, paper that the UK government published earlier this month, which you, again you referred to in your opening remarks, lists uh, seven um, policy areas where there have apparently been what they describe as standalone sessions, and these overlap with but not, are not identical to the list that you gave the committee a few moments ago. So animal health and welfare, chemicals and pesticides, plant health, food and feed hygiene, nutrition health, public procurement and fertiliser regulations. So. Do I take it from that list that there's acceptance across the governments that those are elements of the UK internal market that would require common frameworks uh, post-Brexit? Uh, I think I'd want Ian to answer that because Ian was at those <coughs> sessions. But I should say at the beginning that any participation, as, as I indicated in my opening statement, is without prejudice to final outcomes. So I'm not saying that we are accepting the UK internal market in any of these areas, but I think there are discussions being held, and these are key issues. But Ian might want to tell us how the, that has operated. Yeah, so we've had a bit of this discussion in previous sessions of the committee. It is not that those areas in their totality are subject to internal market arrangements. It is that within each of these areas, and this applies to potentially any of the 153 areas of intersection, there are aspects of policy where there may be internal market considerations and where there may indeed be considerations drawn from other parts of the principles. Um, now, I don't have before me the detail of the aspects of, of, of those, but the obvious kinds of things that come up are about approaches to, say, food safety, that there will be a discussion about the extent to which it is necessary or desirable to have consistent regulatory regimes, consistent standards and approaches, and where indeed there may be legitimate scope for divergence and what the reasons for that divergence might be. And just, you know, as a small anecdote, when we had a discussion of one of the in one of the early food safety 
um, deep dives, we discovered that water is not simply water. There is spring water, there is highland water, there is tap water, there is various types of water, all possible under the existing EU regulatory regime. So there has been an awful lot of, if I can call it maybe myth-busting, about these discussions so far so that people really do understand the extent of divergence that already exists within the EU regime and to understand what that tells us about the future. And I think it's, it's no surprise that there is a general degree of anxiety about what the future of these arrangements would be on leaving the EU and the sense that whatever the divergence there is now, at least there is the comfort of the certainty of an EU regulatory regime that sits behind it. So it's been trying to get to the heart of those areas where we think actually we need to have certainty in these areas uh, that the administrations will cooperate with each other and those are a subset of the issues that come up under these areas. But it's a very long and complicated discussion to be truly honest and an awful lot has it remains in dispute I would say or, or where discussions remain ongoing between the governments about where necessity and desirability about consistency lies um, but there's also concerns about the the impact from say, say uh, agricultural subsidy in the future now the four governments have different um, priorities in relation to agricultural support arrangements into the future. And those are entirely legitimate, driven by the conditions of agriculture in the different nations. So whilst all the governments would accept that each administration should have its own approach to agricultural support based on the conditions in the country, there's an anxiety about how those rub up against each other and the impact on producers in different parts of, of the UK and whether there could be claims of unfair competition or subsidy regimes which disadvantage others. So these are very complicated arrangements. What we've sought to do is not to leap to the conclusion that there should, therefore there should be an imposition of uniformity across the UK because actually that would be <coughs> a significant backward step from the current arrangements under the EU. That's a very helpful answer, and I'm, great, I'm grateful. Can I, I've got two follow-up questions, from it, hopefully both of which can be qu quick. Um, first, um, the, these seven items that are listed here, um, you know, why have these been the items to which discussions have turned first? Is, uh, is, it because, is this an indication that these are regarded uh, by one government or another as the most pressing issues, as the, as, as, or is this... Or is this um, the, the low-hanging fruit that's you know e easiest to deal with first, or is this an indication of um, uh, a sense that these are the areas that might need some kind of legislative common framework rather than non-legislative common framework, or is it just random? So, so they are a subset of the 24 and the mm -hmm. 24 areas we prioritise. And beyond that, it's simple because there are established, well-working, functioning arrangements which has made it possible for those discussions to proceed more quickly than perhaps in other areas. So it is, it's, it's not entirely random, um, but it doesn't indicate a ranking of priority of these or the other aspects of the 24. Okay. And so uh, what, uh, the final question for me on, on this, um, what are the other... Um, issues. If, if we were looking at this in 12 months' time, presumably the list of bullet points would be, you know, tw twice as long or a bit longer. What are the other issues which are forthcoming, which have not yet had their standalone sessions, which, are, which but which are due to have them in, in, in the near future? So all of the areas of 24 have had at least one standalone session. These have benefited from probably half a dozen standalone right. sessions and have made the progress through for us to be able to populate what's known as an outline template agreement covering all the governance areas that we've identified. Um, we have a phased approach there's a strong project management um, arrangement across the four governments where we monitor the discussions and we identify phases of discussion. Our ambition is that we conclude phase two, which is what these areas have, have concluded um, as soon as possible. Ideally, we would like to have concluded that now, but I would hope within the next three months we could. But you know, given what the minister said about current circumstances, I think we need to be a wee bit wary of putting a fixed date to it. Thank you very much. We we have published the list of 24, yes, so indeed. you know it's, it's you know we're quite happy to have that known. I think we've got it already. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can, can I just ask a supplementary to that? Forgive me, I'm a simple person, but if there are these 12 areas and 24 other areas that require to be discussed to make sure the internal market, for want of a better description, description is able to operate successfully, if on the 29th of March we leave with no deal and there is no common framework in place, how can we have that internal market? 
that's what do you think? That's successful. An excellent question. I have no answer to it. The, the UK government has no answer to it. Uh, you know, we have not seen statutory instruments which would give us the answer to that. We haven't seen statutory instruments that have given us answer to lots of things. You know, for example, we haven't seen statutory instruments on possible tariffs after the 29th of March. So I have to say, you know, we would be in a position, presumably, where the UK government would attempt to impose, and I hope that that would not be the case because we wouldn't cooperate. Yeah. Just, just add a couple of remarks to that. So uh, members of the committee will be familiar with the no deal legislative deficiencies work, the fixing regulations that have been made, and that's an extensive program of introducing temporary um, arrangements covering the deficiencies in EU law in the event of no deal. Now, you know, as the Minister said, that programme is far from complete, but there has been an extensive programme underway, and those arrangements are those that we anticipate being in place um, in the event of no deal, although those do not establish longer-term foundations for, for frameworks. Now, where there are areas for cooperation that aren't covered by uh, legislative fixes, and of course there would be a wide range of pragmatic and practical areas where arrangements would be required, those will require to be negotiated. What we're very clear about is that those must not set a precedent for future frameworks, but they must proceed on the basis of agreement between the administrations because these are devolved areas and there is no reason why they shouldn't proceed by agreement, notwithstanding the circumstances, and they must not jeopardise the future frameworks which will be required once the future relationship with the EU is clearer. That helps me segue quite nicely into James Kelly because he's interested in areas where we can't find agreement and there's dispute. So, James. Indeed, uh, convener. Um, one of the, the issues when the withdrawal bill was, was being sought in terms of uh, legislative consent in the Scottish Parliament was dispute resolution. Um, and there was a, a reasonable objection to the dispute, dispute resolution uh, process that was, that was in place. Um, so I'm interested in what progress has been made in terms of discussions with the UK government and other devolved administrations around the arrangements that will be in place in relation to these 24 areas where there's a, there's a disagreement about how they will operate. It's a very good point because essentially what is being relied on at the present moment is the Memorandum of Understanding on Devolution, which places emphasis on good communication, transparency, in order to avoid disputes. Now, yeah, there isn't good communication and there isn't transparency. So the potential for dispute is undoubtedly there. If, however, you then lean back on the dispute resolution process, the only one that exists within the JMC, then you come in the end to a process in which the decision is made by the UK government without any um, you know, uh, ability to challenge its decision. Uh, you know, for example, the vexed question uh, of the payment, the billion pound payment to uh, the Northern Ireland as a result of the DUP support for the Tories was raised by the Welsh government under the dispute resolution process, saying this is money that should be barnetised and should you know, not be paid in the way it's being paid. That became a non-dispute because the UK government decided it wasn't a dispute. So, you know, in the end, dispute resolution runs into the sand in a court in which judge and jury are the UK government. Now, presently, there is no system accepted by the UK government which would trump that. And that's the issue, because that goes on to the wider issue of intergovernmental uh, relations, uh, you know, of which this really is part. And the prog there has been no significant or any, in my view, progress on intergovernment relations and how you get that into a new footing given the weight of devolution, and, and that remains unresolved. So we aim within this process, and I pay tribute to, to Ian and, and to his colleagues south of the border, actually, we aim during this process to be in a position to resolve issues by negotiation and consensus. But in the end, that's up to politicians and when these issues go from official level and are escalated to politicians, there is no mechanism, satisfactory mechanism, in which you get a resolution. And you know, devolved administrations know that. So, so what you're really saying is you, you said at the start, 
This is the first time you've been in the committee since November, uh, and this has been an ongoing issue of intergovernmental relations and also how to resolve disputes. But there's not really what you're really saying is there's not really been any progress since November uh, till now, and obviously the clock <laughs> continues to tick down to a, a potential withdrawal on the 29th of March. The Welsh government and ourselves. You know, Northern Ireland is, does, does not have a functioning administration, regrettably. The Welsh Government and ourselves believe that the issue of intergovernmental relations and you know, reviewing that, even you know, if you only believe in devolution, and I believe in independence, but if you believe in devolution, requires urgent attention. That has not happened. Uh, there is a process underway which is, in my view, not moving at any pace. We would like that process to speed up. We have a particular urgency with that process, which lies, and we're now straying fairly well away from frameworks, which lies in the area of the Sewell process, which we believe is broken and requires to be fixed. I have written to uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, David Liddington, I think on two, possibly three occasions recently about this. I have discussed it with him on a number of occasions. In fact, uh, a JMC does not take place without me raising it. Um, nothing has yet happened. Uh, now, one might argue that they have had bigger fish to fry, uh, and their, you know, their absorption, as I said at the start, is total in the, in the chaos that exists around Brexit. But it is a concern, because until you resolve... Well, first of all, there has to be a willingness to address the issue. The issue is a hard one for the UK to address, because it would require the UK to accept that the UK Parliament is not sovereign, or at least to allow some understanding of that. It's not a hard one in governmental terms because devolution is not about a hierarchy of governments. It is about a hierarchy of parliaments. But there is a strong reluctance, in my view, to address this issue. Okay. Angela, I think you were interested in this area as well. Yeah, I wanted to pick up in the uh, some of the issues in and around intergovernmental uh, relationships and the, the mechanisms that, that, that support that. Um, and I heard um, with interest what the Cabinet Secretary said earlier about you know, the work around common frameworks is a long-term piece of work. It was never the intention that it was going to be done and dusted by uh, Brexit Day. But the Royal Society of Edinburgh uh, picked up on uh, some of the work and assessment by the uh, uh, PACAC uh, Committee in Westminster that said that intergovernmental relationships and mechanisms that support that, uh, I quote, are not fit for purpose. <laughs> And the Royal Society for Edinburgh uh, have, you know, recommended an independent secretariat to manage and help develop uh, common frameworks. So I wondered what the Cabinet Secretary's uh, view of that suggestion was, uh, given that I'm assuming that he would prefer more formal arrangements as opposed to ad hoc ones, and, you know, whether within government we are developing a, a proposition to, to put to the UK. I mean... To some extent, we have that independent structure anyway, because officials are tasked, were tasked by JMCP in last summer? Uh, preceding December. Oh, right, so for, for, sorry. Uh, over a year have been tasked with taking this forward, and it hasn't happened. The problem doesn't lie with the civil service, the problem lies with politicians. You know, this requires a sense of urgency, it requires addressed, and it is politicians who need to address it. Um, and there needs to be a priority given by politicians. I have, for example, suggested, first of all, that the issue of Sewell, which is the barrier to uh, giving legislative consent to any Brexit legislation, could be addressed separately from this process in a temporary fix. Um, I put forward ideas on that. Nothing has happened, so that's a, a pol politician's issue. Um, and as nothing happens in the UK government without the Prime Minister doing it, or, say, or saying so, it, the problem lies with the Prime Minister, clearly. And until she is prepared to accept that change is required, change will not take place. So no matter how helpful the suggestion from the Royal Society, they should address that to the Prime Minister rather than to anybody else. OK. Um, picking up the point that Mr Russell made about uh, politicians being uh, the problem um, as opposed to... Um, uh, you know, the, the, the civil servant, the intergovernmental structures. Um, I, I'm assuming that we wouldn't want to see local government or stakeholders in civic Scotland uh, treated in ways that we in the past have objected to how we as parliamentarians uh, and this institution 
uh, has been treated. And notwithstanding about what you're saying about priorities, that for many stakeholders, the, the, the priorities just now are around the, you know, the, the more fundamental issues around the, the current chaos uh, that we're in. Um, I wondered uh, what views the Cabinet Secretary had about the role of Civic Scotland, uh, third sector, and in particular local government, um, about informing uh, and advising in a formal uh, or more ad hoc way uh, around common frameworks in the longer term. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely open to that. Um, I, I think if those frameworks are in the end to be established, and we are speculating about that because you know, who knows what will happen tomorrow, let alone you know, in, in a month's time or three months' time, then they, it, it will be important that everybody understands how they operate. Transparency is a key issue in here. And the operation, therefore, how they operate and the engagement and involvement of bodies and organisations is crucial. I've spent time briefing and discussing on this issue with a range of bodies. We're, we're going to do more of it. We are in, in, in phase three of this process. It might be useful just to remind ourselves uh, what that is. Phase one was the, the principles and the proof of concept. Uh, Adam Tompkins referred to principles. That phase went through. Phase two was the, the detail and the development of that detail. That has ha by and large happened. Phase three is the consultation of stakeholders amongst others. And, and that's now underway in these areas. Phase four is final proposals, and phase five is post-implementation. If we ever get to implementation, phase five will be post-implementation. So you know, we are in the middle of that process, and the engagement of stakeholders at every level, whether those be uh, other elected representatives, whether those be the third sector, whether those be business and, and business organizations, need to be engaged in it. Now, of course, not all organizations are involved in everything. So if you look at the, the ones that we've already mentioned, that list of stakeholders is fairly obvious, and they will be involved. Okay, thank you. I think it makes sense at this stage to move on to, this, if that's about intergovernment relations, to move on to issues of how that's all going to be scrutinised. Uh, and I'll come to the issues of trade deals and environmental issues, which others are interested in later. But, Willie, you wanted to ask about scrutiny matters. I think it makes yeah, sense to float in that. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you know the committee has been interested and has raised the issue about scrutiny of the whole framework process for some time now. Could I invite you to gaze forward a little and see if there's any anything on the horizon that's crystallising about how this committee or the Scottish Government or indeed any levels of uh, government might be able to scrutinise what's going on here. If it's shared frameworks, we would assume there'll be shared scrutiny. Yes, and, and you know, we have uh, you know, agreements with the Parliament about how this should take place, information arrangements. There is the ability of the, of the Parliament to question. I wrote to the committee, uh, convener last year about uh, shared work on making sure that we were involving others. I'm absolutely open to this. Um, I think we should have those if these eventually happen. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, if these eventually happen. If we have frameworks in place, if there is a, and there should be a transparency about what they are, there should be a clear set of scrutiny arrangements, which allows people to understand what's happening within them, to question that process. Now, you have existing scrutiny arrangements of ministers and their actions, which are there for, to be used, but I want to make sure that people understand how this operates. This, is, this will be part of the, if it happens, and again, I'm speculating, if this happens, it will be part of the machinery of government going forward. It needs to have a democratic oversight, and therefore we should find a way to, that that takes place. Just as a JMC process should have a democratic oversight. Um, you know, but so far, trying to get the JMC process onto a democratic footing has proved hard enough, but I'm keen that that should happen. Of course, there is a there's an intention to have a number of bodies, you know, which are engaged. The Withdrawal Implementation Act and you know, withdrawal proposals have proposals for a number of bodies. The involvement of the devolved administrations in those is 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 far from guaranteed. You know, we've seen it, for example, with the Trade Remedies Authority, that there is no s structure in place to allow input to the membership of that from the devolved administrations even though both Wales and ourselves have made it absolutely clear that was essential. We're going to see it on the implementation authority, you know, 
uh, there, there doesn't appear to be an acceptance that it is absolutely essential if you're going to, actually if you're going to have the confidence of the devolved um, countries, you need to have that type of involvement. This has just been fought off on the basis that everything must be controlled by the Prime Minister. That is a, not only a fallacy, it is a dangerous and self-defeating fallacy. That's what makes it particularly stupid. So I would want to see a much greater openness the, from the UK government and an understanding that if there are to be new democratic structures, you should build into those democratic scrutiny. Okay. Thank you. Okay. A quick supplementary and then Adam. So Adam oh, first, then Murdo. I'm very struck, um, Cabinet Secretary, by what you said about um, phase three, the consultation pr process, because there doesn't appear to be any reference to that in the UK government's paper published this month. Are, are these consultations public? No, they haven't happened yet, I, but, okay. the, you know, the, but the, the intention in phase three is to have a three-phase uh, structure of uh, involvement, policy development, uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, uh, and then some conclusion. Perhaps Ian would want to say a word about it, because he's at the heart of it. Yeah, Mr Davidson, can I just clarify my question then? Um, uh, so when there is stakeholder engagement, w will there be draft common frameworks to give to stakeholders to engage with, and if so, will um, parliamentarians have sight of them as well? Because we, we haven't seen any, well, we haven't seen any working if, or if draft are, common frameworks. If there are, you will, because it would be wrong if you weren't. But let Ian explain what is intended. Right. right. Yeah. So we're coming to the conclusion of phase two, and we discussed the list of areas earlier where we've made the most progress with those. So the conclusion of phase two is, first of all, that ministers are invited to note the progress that has been made in these areas and to sign off uh, the next phase, which is to move to some stakeholder engagement. So ministers have not yet seen this material in the main either. Um, it is important that at that phase we have a controlled process of stakeholder engagement given the wider context that we're in. So what we're developing between the administrations under phase three is a plan for uh, for that engagement and multilateral engagement and to test it in a couple of areas first and we haven't yet determined which those areas would be but it's likely to be from 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 um, the list that we discussed earlier i think it is really important obviously that pal that parliamentary committees uh, are able to participate in that process as well and we'd want to discuss with you whether it be this committee or some of the subject matter committees would wish to be involved alongside that we would obviously like to do a bespoke Scottish consultation on these areas. What we're talking about under phase three is a joint process of all of the governments with stakeholders. So we'll follow up that discussion with, with clerks, but happy to explain anything more at this at this yeah. stage. Sorry, I just wanted to tease that a little bit mm. further because th this could well involve in a situation where in a framework discussion or any decision made be between the UK and Scottish government, that there's some, some sort of constraint, possibly, on devolved powers in terms of these agreements. So it's not just about really just about consultation then, is it? It's, a, it's just not also about seeking agreement from parliaments, or this parliament in particular for the Scottish Government, to any process where the, the, these agreements might constrain devolved powers, for instance. I think I made it clear at the beginning, we, this is without prejudice to those decisions, yeah. and I would not sign on to those decisions without coming to Parliament for that discussion. In fact, I'm un highly unlikely to sign on to those decisions anyway, but I certainly wouldn't sign on to those decisions. This is about what we will have, non-legislatively, actually, I think, uh, uh, in these cases, um, and how we will take those forward. But you know, it is absolutely essential that that process involves the committees amongst others. Could, could I perhaps just <coughs> clarify? So the, the intention at this stage is to take the outline framework template agreements that have been developed, which identify the scope of where we think a framework way may, may be required, the extent to which cooperation would be necessary or desirable, and the outline of the initial thinking to date of the governance arrangements that would be associated with, with that. So it is no more at this stage than, if you like, a playing out of the thinking that has been done between the governments. If there were any constraints on the exercise 
of competence in that space. They would be entirely voluntary associated with the delivery of the framework. And as we've made clear all the way through this, none of that actually constrains devolved competence because these are documents where we agree to proceed by agreement. If Parliament chose to legislate in any of these areas in the future, then of course it would be free to do so. And But you know there would be reactions from others associated with that, obviously. We'd immediately cease the process. Okay. Uh, Murdo, apologies if any of that question is tripped straight into your area. You well, well, it well, it did actually, but um, apologies. But I, 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 I was just going to ask a question directly to Mr. Davidson in relation to what you've just said, which I think is very interesting. So, if we have a, a, a non-legislative framework created by memorandum of understanding, there's nothing then to prevent either this Parliament or the Westminster Parliament subsequently legislating in a way that is contrary to that in the future. And what is the impact of that? Indeed, that, that is the case because these are devolved areas. Um, it's about the mutuality of interest where the governments agree they choose to cooperate. And as the Section 12 report produced by the UK government has demonstrated, the devolved administrations have made clear that we will continue to discussions, continue discussions, and we would not move arbitrarily to make changes in, in, in devolved law. This is all based on trust and proceeding by agreement. It is quite novel in that respect, but absolutely nothing here constrains the legislative competence okay. Okay. of the Scottish Parliament, and we would not be proceeding on the basis that it would. So, so it's in effect it's a self-denying ordinance, but without any legal impact. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Again, sorry if it's moved straight into your area. Uh, Tom. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. One of the principles outlined by the GMC is to uh, facilitate the implementation of trade deals and international agreements. I wonder if you could explain what you understand the consequences of this to be for devolution and what particular areas of devolved competency would be affected. There is a connection a subject connection between some of the areas we're talking about in terms of frameworks and the issues of trade. Then there are wider issues which trade presents, which are addressed in our paper on trade, <coughs> which I think we published last August, if I remember, um, which sets a context for how we want trade to be carried forward by the UK government. Um, so uh, there isn't a direct link between what we're talking today in each framework and the issue of the wider issue of how trade deals are come to. But there is the, issue, the subject issue, which is extremely important. There's also the wider context of how countries operate in terms of, of trading links. Trade isn't just about one person selling something to another person. Trade is often about the way in which you encourage uh, one person to sell something to another person um, and the type of society in which you both live and how you grow together in that regard and encourage good practice. And we would want that to be part of it. Now, we've been you know, very keen that we see a change in the way in which the UK government approaches the issues of trade. In the current chaos, the, the debate on trade is, is immature. It is based entirely upon you know, uh, some supposed trading advantages that can be come from Brexit where there are none. Um, so it's based on lack of reality, um, falsehood, call it what you will. Um, in those circumstances, we want to continue to influence that debate by saying any new trading arrangements outside the EU, and we don't believe they will be advantageous, would still have to pay attention to the requirements and needs of the devolved administrations and the wider issues of the devolved settlement, not just the narrow issues of the devolved settlement. You said, stated just a moment ago, pay attention to the requirements and needs it's been well documented that in trade negotiations the European Union has undertook that there have been delays in implementations and modifications as a consequence of the objections of sub-state parliaments. I believe Wallonia was one example. Do you imagine the Scottish Parliament being able to exercise such influence within the UK based upon your understanding of the UK government's position? I think that reading of the CETA process is taking the wrong lesson from the CETA process with respect. I think the lesson that should be taken from the CETA process is that if you put all those who have responsibility for issues connected with trade in the same room to negotiate a trading agreement, you get a trading agreement. If, however, you neglect to do so, 
you know, and you forget something in that process, you run into difficulty. I think the UK, which I think has taken the Wallonia example of the CETA Treaty as a fright and said, keep them out of the room, otherwise they might want you know, to say something, uh, that's the wrong thing to do. They should have taken and could still take this as saying, let's make sure that we involve to the greatest degree possible the devolved administrations because of the areas for which they are responsible and to make sure that they are part of the discussion. That's the right lesson to take. And if, if the UK keeps taking the wrong lesson from CETA, it'll do the wrong things. And those things will make it harder for them to get the type of trade treaties they want. Some of those treaties are an impossibility. You know, they, they simply aren't going to be the treaties they want. The discussion this week about how you get a trade treaty with Turkey, you know, even a continuation of the existing arrangement with Turkey, and all that Liam Fox has achieved so far is to have a continuation of the present arrangements with half a dozen countries. How you can get that, the Turks are, the Turkish government is saying, well, you get it by making concessions on migration. That's not a surprise. That's where the Indian government has been for a long time. You know, the issues in trade are complex and they need to be addressed with a type of political maturity and understanding we haven't seen from the UK government. When this committee began its work in common frameworks, it was under perhaps the assumption that there would be some transition or implementation period in which these frameworks could be devised and consulted upon and there could be a great deal of engagement. However, the pall of Brexit uncertainty has increased and we may be in a scenario either four weeks on Friday or potentially at the end of June where the UK leaves the European Union without a deal and consequently with no implementation or transition period. In such a case, it would be necessary for the UK to seek the most expeditious trade deals possible. Do you imagine in such a scenario there would be, with no common frameworks having been agreed, that there would be a mechanism for this parliament, for the Scottish government, to, to be in the room with regards to these trade deals? Or have you had any indication that the UK government would be willing to be accommodating with devolved administrations in such a scenario? No, but I don't think in those circumstances anybody knows where the room would be you know, or who would be in it, uh, you know, because I think it's completely without any guidance as to what would take place. Many countries you know, will step back from that. If, if you know, the unspeakable situation you're describing were to happen, I think in the initial period, many countries would simply step away from any engagement on continuing or new arrangements they would want to, to allow the situation to settle down before they had a judgment as to how they should engage. So I don't see if there, is an, if there were to be a no deal, and, and you know, please God there is not because it's a terrible prospect, but if there was to be a no deal on the 29th of March, then I wouldn't expect any progress on this issue in, in the short term or even the medium term. Um, you would have the ones that have been reached the Faroe Islands, Palestine, Israel, one or two others, would continue in existence. But I don't think you'd have anything new. And the UK would become a third country you know, in, in EU terms. So there would be very considerable difficulties there, both in terms of import and export, for a period of time. And that is simply reality. I mean, you know, that's not exaggeration of any description. Thank you. Okay. Patrick, you were interested in this area as well, I think. Um, I think it's the, 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 the trade issues that I wanted to raise have been covered, okay. uh, but it perhaps links into the environmental aspects. Well, as do, well. you want, do you want to kick off the environmental stuff just now then? And I'll come well, to I mean, it, after that. A, a large part of the contents of, of trade agreements and the, the issues that may touch on devolved competence do relate to uh, environmental governance and regulation and a, a great deal of the concern uh, around the, the loss of environmental governance functions at EU level uh, is um, touches again on, on devolved areas. The Scottish Government has said that it wants to uh, agree common approaches where appropriate uh, in these areas, but it also wants to avoid any diminution uh, of the very strong uh, constraints that exist at EU level on, uh, uh, on EU member states. It seems to me that, that we're reaching a point where that's going to become increasingly difficult. The UK government has published its proposals on environmental principles, which are uh, severely limited in their application. For example, uh, 
uh, they're, uh, they're not going to have any application to taxation, spending or the allocation of resources within government, which seems to suggest that the Treasury just doesn't want any truck with this business. Um, the uh, Office for Environmental Protection, the, the new body, uh, is going to have its scope limited uh, away from anything to do with uh, novel changes in policy, uh, anything that isn't strictly environmental law. Um, to what extent does the Scottish Government now feel it is going to be possible both to achieve common approaches in environmental uh, governance and regulation where appropriate and to avoid diminution because the UK Government seems dead set on diminution? Yeah, um, I think the prospect of common approaches producing a continuity of standard are limited and becoming more limited by the day. I mean, I'm, I don't think that's the UK government's objective. Uh, I think the UK government's objective is to diminish environmental standards over a period of time, no matter what is being said, just as I believe the objective would be to uh, diminish human rights and employment standards. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe any assertions to the contrary. Um, I was interested to note in the um, new BBC Channel interview with the Icelandic president, uh, a very clear view that she expressed that being part of environmental standards for Iceland has been very important, European environmental standards, and that whilst it's a disadvantage not to be involved in setting those, and that's why Scotland should be an independent member of the EU, it was very important to have those observed. So I remain of the belief, as, as I believe the Scottish Government does, that continuing within European environmental standards would be the right thing to do. Um, the, my colleague Rosanna Cunningham is consulting on environmental governance, and that's the right thing to do. Um, there are, as, as, as you know, Mr Harvey, possibilities still in this area with the question of keeping pace powers, which was a, you know, one of the many parts, I have to say, of the continuity bill that the Supreme Court was happy about, and how we apply those and how we take that issue forward is a matter for discussion between the parties. You will, I'm sure, want to bring to the table that issue, and you will have my sympathetic support in how we find a way to do so. So I would want to make sure that we continue with those um, in the interim period where we, if there is a period in which we are not a member, and that is not an inevitability in my view, but if there was an interim period in which Scotland was not a member of the EU, we would want to maintain those and not diminish them in any way, um, and therefore parallel action with those who are diminishing them would simply not be possible. You've, uh, you've touched on the, the Scottish Government actions on this, and of, of course, if, if there is going to be, or to, what, to whatever extent there will be a common approach, it, it's about the, the actions of, of both governments. So um, the Scottish Government's consultation um, on principles has, as you say, been published. It's, it's an open-ended consultation. It doesn't include specific proposals on <coughs> governance, uh, and uh, the, uh, the expert roundtable that the Scottish Government convened uh, agreed that for most EU governance functions, there are no equivalent domestic bodies at present. So, again, you know, in order to know whether it's going to be possible to achieve these objectives of maintaining standards and achieving some kind of common approach where appropriate, we not only need to to hear a critique of the UK government's proposals, but we need to have some clarity about when the Scottish government is going to come forward with its proposals, uh, not just on the principles, but on the governance structures and how they will exercise robust powers, uh, particularly in times when government might not want them to. Well, and as the next environment minister, I'm familiar with that concept, I have to say, uh, on both sides of it. Um, I think it is important that the cabinet secretary for the environment addresses these issues with you, not, uh, you know, I can't speak for her and shouldn't speak for her in areas of her policy, but I am convinced that her objectives are the same as mine, and those objectives are to maintain the highest standards, to ensure that those standards are enforced, and it would not be to allow any drift or de determined drive downwards, um, and it, those should then lead to decisions on the areas you're talking about, but she will be mindful of what you have asked me here. I will make sure that she's aware of that, and I'm sure she will want to respond to it. Alex, uh, thank you. Uh, Patrick's uh, covered all the points I was going oh, to Again, ask. apologies to you if I didn't. That's all. Do you want to cover as well? Yes, thank you, convener. Good morning.
morning. Um, I'm interested in the, some clarity over protected geographical indicator status and how does that fit in with common frameworks that might be an internal market uh, issue. And PGIs are about promoting the provenance of the produce in Scotland, beef, lamb, salmon and whisky, of course. And because they contribute to our food and drink uh, industry, £14 billion a year, it's really important to protect our rural economy, our Scottish economy, our jobs and everything. So, And I know you've talked about the progress that has been made already with uh, food and food and feed hygiene and safety law and animal health and welfare and so there's a progress that's been made already so i'm interested in the fact that if there's a no deal we won't have any protection at all for the pgis and they're in the current withdrawal agreement so and people have told me that this would be devastating for our businesses so i'd be interesting to to hear about some further assurances of equivalent schemes or pgi or where are we with that I'd be interested to hear those assurances too. The UK government has offered no such assurances. They published some proposals last week or the week before without consultation. I think it's a very serious situation. Uh, you know, the European PGI system has been extremely good for these businesses. You know, the ones you mentioned, yes, but Stornoway Black Pudding, our both Smokies, Dunlop Cheese. You know, these are these are these are products which are the highest reputation and standard. You know, which have benefited from. European Protected Geographical Indicator status. And it is yet another example of how mad this process is, that that would be thrown away in these circumstances. And even madder if there was to be a no deal and that protection was removed. I'm not saying there are hordes of people ready to fabricate you know, uh, false black pudding, but you know this is an important part of the market and it, you know, it is easy to diminish it. And you know there is a serious issue about what, for example, American producers of whiskey might want to call their product in order to sell it as something it isn't. And that's what it, this is about. You, know, you shouldn't be selling things on a false prospectus but get, uh, and unable to match the quality, the taste, the provenance of these items. Now, if there is a no deal, clearly one of the things that we will require to do, and you know, obviously that is, is of an urgency, is to try and find some protection. But it's difficult for us to bring that protection just immediately. It won't have the reputation that the European system has. The European system works for two reasons. It has a reputation, and it's European-wide, but also it's enforceable. And that's a key issue. It, it is enforceable. You can't just call something, you know, uh, having PGI status. If you do it falsely, then you're in trouble. So we would want to do what we could to help, but it does illustrate how this issue goes down to every level, you know, a cheesemaker in Dunlop, you know, is going to be disadvantaged by the chaos that's been cre created at Whitehall. Just a quick stop to that. I'm aware that the American beef lobby have lobbied their own um, uh, trading uh, consultation to basically say that the beef um, coming from America to Europe has flatlined. So they are seeking to uh, reduce the welfare so that would mean hormone-injected beef, which we don't want in this country, or other approaches. I'm aware of dairy farms and um, somatic cell counts, which is an issue that I've <laughs> looked at as well. So having a PGI status would, uh, in a wider European context would protect our produce. There is a high standard in food safety, and there is a high standard in terms of reputation and provenance. You know, that, that's really important. Um, and that is an approach that has been built over many years. And in the last 12 years of SNP government, the issue of, of Scottish food and drink and its export has become a huge one. You know, the percentage of, of the Scottish economy devoted to this is much greater than it is south of the border. In all, and that's also true in Wales and in Northern Ireland. In those circumstances, we should do everything we can to support and develop those industries. And you know, actions that do not do that, we should roundly condemn. We should also refuse to accept lower standards. I mean, you know, Patrick Harvey has been talking about lower environmental standards. It's part of the same argument. What, what, how on earth have we got to the situation where we are actively trying to negotiate lower standards in every part of our national life, including trading? How on earth could we get there? But that's where we are today.
OK, thank you. Thanks. I was just one final question, a sweep-up question, um, Cabinet Secretary. You referred a number of times in your contributions to Section 12 of the EU Withdrawal Act and the freezing powers. And I just wondered if you'd had any discussions at any stage with the UK Government about the nature and type of progress that's obviously been made that we've been hearing about from Ian in regard to common frameworks that might give them sufficient comfort to be able to repeal these powers? Well, as we do not require, re regard the powers as legitimate anyway, we do not accept that the powers are necessary. Um, we have not you know, said to them in any formal way in recent months, I can't remember doing so, please repeal these. What we've said to them is, if you use these powers, then that actually, what that does is freezes our cooperation. We stop cooperating with you on that issue immediately. So, so far, so good. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a half empty and half full glass here, you know, um, within a within a, a wider sense in which there's a drought on all of this, you know, there is a small amount of positivity about the fact that we've been able to agree two quarterly reports on the basis they haven't used the powers and don't need to and don't anticipate using them. That's good news. But, you know, it's up to them whether they keep the act or not. It is of, you know, it is dead to us and we don't acknowledge its legitimacy. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, uh, can I thank you and your officials for giving us evidence this morning? The committee previously agreed to take the next item in private, so I close this public part of the meeting.